We greet you in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. I am Frank Smith, pastor of Christ's Church for our community here in Louisville, Kentucky. And I greet you here from our pulpit, thanking God for allowing us to have this opportunity to share. I greet you from the city of the late Brianna Taylor. I greet you from the city of the Louisville Slugger. Three times you're out. I greet you from the city of Muhammad Ali, the knockout man, where you can certainly appreciate the fact that we are the home of the Kentucky Derby, and we're gonna run on and see what the end is going to be. The home of the Kentucky Fried Chicken, where we preach the Kentucky Fried Gospel. If you don't believe and obey the original recipe, then one day you will be extra crispy. We're glad to have this opportunity. We greet the Board of Trustees of Ozark Christian College, President Matt Proctor, all of the college officials and the faculty, and especially the student body. We greet you and we hope that you are being blessed in this preaching and teaching convention. Certainly, we greet you also from Simmons College of Kentucky, where I serve as Executive Vice President, a sister ABHE school, Louisville's private historically black college. And we're grateful that we can share in the accreditation journey together and uh, that we appreciate the opportunity for biblical higher education. I am honored to have been asked to share today in this preaching and teaching convention we shared many years ago and grateful for uh, the opportunity to share with you again. Today there are passages that I want to look at. The first is John 14 and verse 6. Jesus saith unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Also, 1 Timothy 1 and verse 15, it says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. And then another passage for our message today is found in the Acts of the Holy Spirit in the Apostles. Chapter 4, beginning with verse 8. Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, said unto them, Ye rulers of the people and elders of Israel, if we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man, by what means he is made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which is become the head of the corner, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Yes, today we will preach from the subject, Jesus still saves. Jesus still saves. Beginning before the fall of mankind in the Garden of Eden, the voice of God has been confronted by the opposing voice of Satan. Adam and Eve and all of mankind ever since has been introduced to the notion that the authority and sovereignty of the Almighty God is worthy of query and scrutiny. Different notions 
and differing ideas about the command of God were posed, which were totally opposite from what God said. As a result, mankind fell and has been stumbling and bumbling ever since. The life and times of humanity suggest such norms of pluralism, inclusivism, and relativism are much more suited for the changing times and generations than the absolute authoritative standard of all that is true and divine. So, it is no surprise that in this convention we find it necessary to uplift absolute truth, the stillness of the Bible, God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the church, and the preaching of the gospel. As necessary and relevant for any and all ages of humanity. But I'm excited today to get to talk about Jesus, my Savior, my Lord, and my Redeemer. Jesus is not the Savior among many saviors, but rather Jesus is the only Savior. The holy scriptural text that I've read emphatically declare that if you want to be saved, if you want to get to where God lives, if you want to enjoy access into glory, if you want to be delivered and be rescued from all things destructive, there is only one who can save, and that one is Jesus. Yes, he came into the world to save sinners, and I am a sinner, and you are a sinner, and that means that he came to save me, and he came to save you. As long as there are people still sinning, Jesus is still the Savior. In a world that says that all roads lead to heaven, we believe that only Jesus still saves. Now, I don't have much time today to talk about other world religions, for what I want to focus on is Jesus. But I do need us to understand that everyone talking is talking the same way about going to live with God. Everyone does not believe in an afterlife, but you and I are committed to a journey, a journey that will take us from earth to glory, a journey that will liberate us from these mundane shores and uplift us to celestial portals wherein we will praise and we will adore the one who made, the one who regenerated us, and the one who set us free from sin and all other bondage. Many people do not believe in the idea of absolute truth and the uniqueness of religious beliefs. Relativism and tolerance have trumped truth and absolutes. As Erwin Lutzer puts it in his work, Christ, among other gods, he says, we have moved from the conviction that everyone has a right to his own opinions to the notion that every opinion is equally right. We have moved, he says, from genuine pluralism to the, the idea that religions of the world can peaceably coexist. We have moved to syncretism, the idea that the beliefs of various religions can be mindlessly combined. As Paul Copen puts it, all religions aren't basically the same. They differ profoundly in major ways. What they have in common is that they are so different. And so my first point today is I want to talk about the clear definition of salvation, the clear definition of salvation before we could adequately trumpet what 
the fact that Jesus still saves, we need to highlight just what salvation is. For the purposes of this message, salvation is the work of God in which he has provided a way for people to be delivered from their sinful condition by means of the sacrificial death of Christ and his resurrection from the dead. The primary Old Testament verb for salvation is the Hebrew verb Yahshua, to save, deliver, and rescue. In the New Testament, the Greek words are sozo, to save, preserve, and rescue, or soteria, salvation and deliverance. The deliverance of the Israelites from Egypt was one of the most powerful demonstrations of God's ability to deliver. And from this event, the people acknowledged that God is the source of salvation and that what was impossible from a human perspective was an opportunity for God to display his grace and power for those he loved. God's salvation in the Old Testament is more than national. It also included individuals who put their faith in him as found recorded in Hebrews 11. When the Lord Jesus came to earth, angels announced that a savior had been born, Luke 2, 11. John the Baptist declared that Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. Jesus himself stated that he came to give his life as a ransom for sin, and in Matthew 20, 28, and that he came, Luke 19, 10, to seek and to save the lost. The night before his crucifixion, Jesus explained to his disciples that his death was for the forgiveness of sin, Matthew 26, 28. But it wasn't until after his resurrection that they fully understood this truth, Luke 24. And so viewing this multifaceted doctrine of salvation is like looking into the kaleidoscope of theological terms. Each word brings new facets of information depending on the perspective or the viewpoint. Some of these words found throughout the scriptures are redemption or reconciliation, propitiation, uh, regeneration, eternal life, delivered, freedom, justification, grace, victory, peace, forgiveness, hope, chosen, adoption, sanctified, glorified, fellowship, inheritance, and blessed. All of these uh, descriptive terms speak to the beauty of and the richness of our salvation in Jesus the Christ. Let us also remember, according to Titus 2.11, that the, it is the grace of God that brings salvation. It's not because we've been so cute or so careful, but it has been God's grace that made salvation possible through Jesus the Christ. Jesus is that Savior. His very name, Yeshua, or Jehovah saves, embodies uh, salvation. Joseph, his stepfather, would have had a name for the child, but Joseph was not worthy to provide the name for this child. For there was the heavenly Father, Almighty God, who decided what the name would be. And people today would like to rename that child. They would like to rename that Savior. But there is no other name 
There is no other name that can qualify, no other name, no other authority for salvation, but the authority given by the Heavenly Father. And that name is Jesus. When it comes to salvation, the Almighty God has to be the authority. World religions may focus today on meditation. World religions may focus today on liberation, but they do not focus on salvation. Joseph is a picture of us. And while we may think we know what is going on, we cannot determine or decide a better name. The Heavenly Father is greater than us all. I want you to know that salvation is not just about existential affairs, meaning what's in the here and now uh, or what's below, but salvation, I'm talking about God's salvation, is also about eschatological affairs. Uh, it's metaphysical, meaning it's beyond time and space. It's about what's above or that of eternal interest. We are not only being saved and delivered while on this earth, but we need a salvation that is able to carry us from earth to glory. In the Old Testament, it was God for us. In the Gospels, it is God with us. And in the Holy Spirit, it is God in us. God is doing a great work that revolves around us. And it is all about bringing us to be his habitation, to be his dwelling. His name embodies salvation, and his name embodies every claim. Jesus is utterly unique among the world religions. Christ is unique in who he was. He is unique in what he claimed, and he is unique in what he did. Here are some of the ways that he differs from other religious leaders. Unlike, unlike so many other religious leaders, he made his own identity the focal point of his teaching, who he was, not just what he said was the essential issue. He didn't say, I am God's messenger, or he did not say that I can point the way to God. He said in various ways that he is God. He claimed to be far more than just a teacher or a prophet. He did not claim to point to the truth, but he claimed to be the truth. He claimed to be sinless. He didn't just point the way to salvation. He claimed to be the only source of salvation. He claimed that a person's eternal destiny all depended on the way they responded to him. He claimed to forgive people's sins, and no other religious leader made that claim. He made predictions about the future. He didn't just claim to lead to life. He said he was the life. He performed numerous miracles, and he's the only one to come back from the grave. If you go to the grave of Muhammad, his bones are still there. If you go to the grave of Buddha, his bones are still there. But if you go to the tomb of Jesus, his bones are not there. Why? Because Jesus is alive. Jesus is raised from the grave. So that's the clear definition of salvation. Second, I want to talk about the claimed demonstration of salvation, the claimed demonstration of salvation. There's a story of a man who decided to go fishing, and he got into his boat, and he went out in, onto the lake, and he got out in his boat, and he stood up to get something, and he lost his balance, and he fell into the lake. And there he was in the lake, screaming and crying for help with his arms just flailing around. And three different men came by and saw the man in the lake. 
the first man looked at the situation, but he knew that he was an average swimmer, and he could not swim well enough to get to him and successfully get the both of them out of the water. The second man jumped in. He was a good swimmer, but when he got to the man, he could not save him because the man was fighting too much. And so he left him out there and he swam back to the bank and said, I could have saved him if he had not been fighting so much. Well, the third man waited until he saw the, the drowning man go down and not come up anymore. And that's when the third man jumped in and went out to get that man and brought the man back to the bank. What are you saying, Frank? I'm saying that the first man represents the time before the law, the dispensation of Abraham. This was faith, the time simply to say that there is a God. The second man represents the law or the dispensation of Moses. The law could not save us, but only reflects that we must be accountable to God, and yet we could not do the things that the law required, and the law could not save us. But the third man represents Jesus, for this picture of the third man shows that Jesus waited until we went down. And then he came down through 40 and two generations, down from heaven's glory, down to this low land of sin and sorrow. And when we could not carry ourselves out of the water, Jesus was strong enough to carry our weight on his shoulders. Well, Jesus still saves because he's the only one who could qualify. In the Old Testament, the Jews offered sacrifices, but Jesus literally became the sacrifice. Jesus still saves. He still justifies us. What does that mean? He's gotten us out of the water but Jesus still saves. He still sanctifies us. What does that mean? He's getting the water out of us. Help me somebody. And then yes, he has saved us from the world. That's justification. But yes, he's trying to get the world out of us. That's sanctification. And ultimately, he teaches us how to swim, and that is glorification. Jesus still saves. Jesus saves mankind at every level. When you go back to Luke chapter 2 and verse 52, it says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. Well, when he increased in wisdom, that's intellectually. When he increased in stature, that is physically. When he increased with favor with God, that is theologically. And when he increased in favor with man, that is socially. So in all of our existential living, at every level, Jesus is still able to rescue us still able to save us, still able to deliver us. There is no time and there is no season and there is no period in which Jesus cannot fully bless us and transform us. Why? For Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, aha, uh -huh, today and forever. Now, I want you to know that some world religions teach that you got to die to save their God. But in our case, our God died to save us. And the greatest part of this claimed demonstration as to why only Jesus still saves is that he fulfilled what the Father required. If you want to know the main reason why mankind still needs the Jesus who still saves is because Jesus conquered death, hell, 
and the grave. Jesus came to this world on a distinct mission. He was on his way to Calvary's mountain. Why? Because he had to save us who were drowning. He had to carry our weight. Yes, he took up his cross. He carried his cross. He was nailed to his cross. But there was something heavier than the cross. It was the reason that he came to this world in the first place. He came to save us from our sins. He was able to carry our weight. And they lifted up that cross. And that cross was previously portrayed by the serpent, the brazen serpent that Moses lifted up in the wilderness such that anyone who was bitten by those snakes had to look to that one serpent, that one serpent. There were not several serpents, but if they wanted to be saved from the snake bite, they had to look to that one serpent. And when they looked to that brazen serpent, the Bible says they lived. Well, Jesus, was lifted up so that he may draw all of mankind unto him. He was lifted up so that by faith we can see victory over sin that he accomplished on our behalf. He was lifted up as an innocent and sinless Savior with humility in his heart. He was lifted up and able to say, Father, Forgive them, for they know not what they do. He was lifted up to say, Mama, you have someone who will take care of you. He was lifted up to say, It is finished. He was lifted up to say, Into thy hands I commend my spirit to the same God who said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was lifted up, I tell you, for everything he experienced while he existed on this earth. We experience today, we face times of separation, times of ridicule, times of suffering, times of intense pain, times of burdens that we have to bear, times when we feel like we've been beaten up by life, times when we have struggled and have been humiliated, times when we have been misunderstood, times when we feel forsaken, times when we don't think we can endure, times when we lack nourishment, times when we feel all alone. Any time we look to our Savior, Jesus, we find he still saves, he still delivers, he still brings us through, he still looks out for us, he still makes a way out of no way. I tell you, Jesus still saves. Well, he died on that cross. But when he died, he did not use his death to take a nap. But no, he died, and then he punched the clock and went right to work. For the Bible says in 1 Peter 3.19, he went to preach to the spirits in prison. And if I could use my sanctified imagination, I see him walking in down there and going in and I can imagine that he shook Abraham. Abraham, wake him up. Well, Abraham shook Isaac, and Abraham said to Isaac, Isaac, wake him up. And Isaac shook Jacob, and Jacob, uh, wake up your 12 sons. And so Jacob shook Reuben, and Reuben 
shook Simeon, and Simeon shook Levi, and Levi shook Judah, and Judah shook Dan, and Dan shook Naphtali, and Naphtali shook Gad, and Gad shook Asher, and Asher shook Issachar, and Issachar shook Zebulun, and Zebulun shook Joseph, and Joseph shook Benjamin, and they each shook their wives, and the wives shook the children, and the children shook their children. And as everyone uh, is waking up, wiping the grave crust out of their eyes, there stood Jesus preaching, Jesus standing, Jesus proclaiming. Uh, who else could say that they went to preach in the grave to some people who were formerly disobedient? But that's not all. Jesus still saves. Yes, he died, and he was buried and went to preach to the spirits in prison. But then early on the first day of the week, he got up from the grave with all power in his hands. He died the lamb, but he got up functioning as the high priest, carrying the blood that was shed to the throne room. Only Jesus I said only Jesus is the only one who has been dead but is alive forevermore. Only Jesus is the Savior who himself participated in the very work of salvation himself. Uh, Jesus still saves existentially from below. Uh, Jesus still saves eschatologically from above. But Jesus still saves from down under. Am I right about it? For the grave cannot hold him. And just as the grave can hold him. The grave cannot hold us. Only Jesus still saves us from death. Jesus is the only one who has been to heaven. Can you say yes? And Jesus is the only one who can show us how to get there and to get there from here. Hallelujah to his name. Let me go on to my third point, which is the call to discipleship in salvation. The call to discipleship in salvation. Jesus commissions us to simply follow him. Follow me, he says. Learn the things I've commanded you. Do the things I've given you to do. Go where I told you to go. Say what I've told you to say. Be who I've told you to be. Serve how I told you to serve. Preach what I told you to preach. And trust me and obey. But Jesus is still calling disciples today. Here I am. And there you are, and we have tried him, and we too can declare, we can joyfully proclaim that just as he picked up his cross, I too must still pick up my cross. Just like he carried the weight of my sins, I too must take up my responsibility to uplift those who are downtrodden around me. I too must preach the good news and the glad tidings of the gospel of peace. I too must advocate for the ones who have no voice. I too must share of myself so that they might see Jesus now that I have been saved. Now that you have been saved, now that we are being saved and have been placed in the body of Christ, we must go out and strengthen the brethren. We must go out and uplift the people. We must go out and speak out for justice. We must make sure that the policies that oppress people are eradicated by town by town city by city, state by state, region by region, and nation by nation, right along with abortion and homosexuality. We've got to address the totality of morality issues, the redistribution of wealth, the redress 
of the descendants of slavery in America. We got to use our influence to turn over the money changing tables that commit extortion on the backs of the poor and the oppressed in this nation. We got to take our stand if we name the name of Jesus, even if it means our political views have to change for there are no politics that can stand against the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He is the sovereign Lord and to him all knees must bow and to him every tongue must confess that he is the Lord. I ask the question, have you decided, really decided to follow Jesus? It's one thing to say Jesus still saves, but have you decided to still follow Jesus? Don't let Jesus go down the road he's going and we get off over here and we get off over there. Just like we want to say that Jesus still saves, am I still committed to following Jesus? Will I say what Jesus is saying? Will I do what Jesus wants done? Will I go where Jesus wants me to go? That is the question and people will know that Jesus still saves if the people he is saving are still following him. Do you get my point? Well, I'm truly getting ready to close with the celebratory declaration of salvation. I, the celebratory declaration of salvation. I, 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 this, this has to do, amen, the impact uh, that Jesus still saves is that he has saved my life. You are still declaring that he has saved your life. The thing got so good to the apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1, verse 15, that he said, I have to throw my situation into the mix. I've got to testify what he has done for me. That Christ Jesus, he says, came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. How be it for this cause I obtain mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Jesus still saves because I'm still a living witness that he is saving my life and he is keeping back what I deserve because he has shown me mercy. He has given me mercy and I have obtained mercy. And this situation of my life is set as a pattern to them who are coming after me who will also believe on him to life everlasting. I like how the new life or the new living translation phrased it. He says, this is why God had mercy on me so that Christ Jesus could use me as a prime example of his great patience with even the worst sinners. Then others will realize that they too can believe in him and receive eternal life. Paul was saying he brought me out and he can bring you out. He changed me and he can change you. He rearranged me and he can rearrange you. He delivered me and he can deliver you. He transformed me and he can transform you. I tell you that Jesus still saves. He's the only one who can save. His touch is inspiring. His eyes are penetrating. 
His ears are attentive. His message is truth. His presence is motivating. His spirit is comforting. His love is unfathomable. His grace is unbelievable. His mercy is everlasting. His power is unlimited. His peace is incomprehensible. His joy is unspeakable. His help is reliable. His promises are dependable. He is faithful in all and he is faithful to all. I'm glad that I know Jesus. His ways are above our ways. His thoughts are above our thoughts. His wisdom is above our wisdom and his methods are above our methods. And Jesus can not only do what we need, but he is what we need. We need a savior to save us from our sin. We need a physician, a divine physician, to heal us of our sicknesses. We need a refuge in which to hide during the storms of life. We need an ever-present help. Yes, in a time of desperation, we need a way through the wilderness of this present world. We need a light to guide and direct our footsteps and we need a friend who will stick closer than a brother. Yes, Jesus will help the helpless. He will love the unlovely. He will bless the burden. He will comfort the dying. He will calm the frustrated. He will strengthen the weak. He will liberate the possessed. He will heal the sick. He'll save the lost. And he will welcome the prodigals back home. I'm so glad that Jesus still saves. We've got the clear definition of salvation, the claim demonstration of salvation, the call to discipleship in salvation, and the celebratory declaration of salvation. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast called me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Thank you, Jesus. Though Satan should buffet and though trials should come, let this blessed assurance control. He regardeth my state and he remembered no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, oh my soul, my sin, oh the bliss of this glorious thought. My sin not in part, but the whole is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, it is well with my soul. That's the evidence that Jesus still saves is when you and I can follow him and bear witness to the fact of what he can do in our lives. God bless you. May heaven smile upon you. And I pray that this word has been an inspiration that you will go and tell everybody, Jesus still saves. Jesus still saves. Jesus still saves. There is no time that he will stop saving. If you need him today, he can save you and you ought to give God a try through the saving grace of Jesus Christ. God bless you and may heaven smile upon you. Our God, we thank you today. We thank you for your unconditional love. We thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We are thankful for the cross, for every time we see it, it's a reminder that we have a Savior who still relates to our existential situations. And he's a Savior who will be there for us eschatologically when he will take us from earth to glory. Oh, thank you, God, for your masterful plan of redemption. Before the foundation of the world, you have this all laid out, and I'm so glad about it. You spent time upon time illustrating it through the Old Testament so that all generations could be looking forward to the God with us. 
and thank you now because he was with us that now he can be God in us through your Holy Spirit. Thank you and we glorify you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen.